Coming up on podcast 1397, the Hyundai Kona gets another refresh with CATL batteries. I know what you're thinking. It's just had a refresh. I know it's getting another one. Stick around. I'll tell you more. Also on the podcast today, we're talking VW ID Buzz and how it's looking inside. We've got some official shots of the interior. Tesla becomes the target of Chevy dealers. And we ask whether the events in Ukraine could set back the movement towards EVs. It's the least important thing, obviously, to talk about in that situation. But it's interesting to have a discussion about it for now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you're listening or watching around the world, welcome to EV News Daily, your trusted source of EV information. It's Monday, 7th of March. My name is Martin Lee, and it's my job to go through every EV story so you don't have to. Welcome to a brand new Patreon producer signing up to support the show. Thank you so much, Ian Harrison. Thank you, my friend, uh, for supporting the show, getting on the air. And if you want to do the same, I'd invite you to have a look at the Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash evnewsdaily. Okay, we will kick off with news about the ID buzz, and that is Volkswagen putting out some official photos of the inside. Now, we have seen the inside of the ID buzz and buzz cargo already. The cargo version had a, a pretty lengthy tour around it with our friend Björn Newland in Norway, and the interior of the buzz had some leaked shots already, but now we have the official photos of the five seater version. ID buzz providing space for 1,121 litres of luggage, even with every passenger on board. Maximum storage volume of the ID buzz cargo. It's got that partition behind the front row seats is 3.9 cubic metres. That's two Euro pallets worth. The ID Buzz available in seven single colour options and four two-tone colour schemes. And that's what we're seeing here in these photos. It's the orange and the cream, or orange and white. Uh, they say, Volkswagen say, a combination of white and fresh colours is carried through the interior. Elements of the original T1 generation. Transferring them to the current era of electric mobility is how VW puts it. The colours correspond to the exterior paintwork and are optionally reflected in things like seat cushions and dash panels and door trims as well. The background lighting, 30 different colours. If you've been in those ID vehicles like the ID3, ID4, you'll know it kind of plays with light and things like that, and I'm sure the bars will be exactly the same. Leather and other materials of animal origin don't feature at all in this vehicle, replaced with substitute materials with similar properties, similar feel. We know you don't need to make a car by using animal products anymore. The alternatives are more than good enough. And so check out the pictures if you get a chance. I'll pop a link in the show notes if you want to see more of them as well. Now, in, in one of the many, many ID Buzz YouTube videos that we saw after that covered drive, that event that that was a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was longer, but all the videos came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, some of the close-ups, you could see just where the camouflage hadn't quite gone all the way around, particularly around the parking sensors, because you can't cover the parking sensors, and they were bright orange. So I think the vehicles, I imagine, when we get to see that in just a few days' time, it's March 9th, the official release, they might well be going for the bright orange exterior, or at least that was what was underneath the camo wraps of the ID but not long to wait now. We get all the official pictures and pretty good idea of what the thing looks like inside and out. Now, five-seater version, short wheelbase, not coming to the US. You'll be waiting for the long wheelbase version of that 2023, maybe even early 24 for US buyers. Vehicle goes into production this September. And so over here in Europe, maybe not right-hand drive here in the UK, possibly though, certainly deliveries before the end of the year. And that for me, would be the ideal two-car driveway or two-car garage. If you know, if we could afford it to buy a new one of those, it would be an ID Buzz for family duties and then something small and zippy around the city. All right, moving on. Tesla has become the target of the Chevrolet National Dealer Council Chairman's ambitions, according to this tesla article. Keith McCluskey is the Chevrolet National Dealer Council Chairman, and he has his sights aimed high as the veteran automaker increases its efforts to break into the EV sector. Amidst GM's continued EV efforts, Mr. McCluskey maintained Chevy dealers are looking to beat Tesla. He said, we want to beat Tesla on EVs, we want to meet demands. 
Okay. The article continues. Being General Motors' high volume brand expectations are high, that Chevrolet will be producing EVs from numerous price points for customers. And that's very true. Uh, there will be the Silverado EV. There will be the Equinox. There will be the Blazer. The Equinox should start less than $30,000, a price that might get competitive against many cars, not just EVs. But really, come on, GM need to get some serious uh, production going to say that you're going to beat Tesla. I'm all for ambition. I'm all for optimism. I'm all for fighting talk, and that's great. But I'm also all for realism. Yeah, Tesla produced 900,000 odd vehicles last year. Could be 1.4 million this year. Everyone's, you know, every Tesla expert's got a number, and it depends on how different facilities ramp or not with Texas and Berlin. But still. I mean, you're not going to beat Tesla for a very, very long time, GM. A very long time. But we like the ambition of the dealers. So let's keep that going. Now, let's talk about our headline story today, and that is Hyundai refreshing the Kona. Now, for my US viewers, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, they've just refreshed it. It's just arrived. Yeah, well, you're getting the version that I was driving over a year ago, and that is the kind of mid-cycle refresh of the Kona. This is an all-new Kona. Now, we've talked about the all-new Kia e-Nero recently on this podcast, but now we find out more details about the new Kona Electric. And we'll get more details officially next month in April, when we get the, hopefully, hopefully full reveal, a different look from previous Konas. It's going to be a bigger car. And that would be my only criticism. It's not even a criticism. We had one for three months last year at the beginning of 2021. And it was just the rear was just a little bit too small because that time our little fella was still in quite a, a large baby seat. You know how it is. The younger kids are, the bigger the baby seats, right? And it's just, he was always kicking the back of my wife's chair when we were driving. And so uh, this could well be an option for us going forward because the back is going to get a little bit bigger, a bit like the e-Nero or Nero EV. Uh, the batteries underneath the new Kona uh, will be continue to be supplied by LG, but also they're adding CATL, the Chinese company, with the lithium-ion phosphate cells. Now, it's the 6th of next month that we'll hopefully see this second-generation Kona launched in Korea. Um, CATL added with existing battery supplier LG to improve export competitiveness, including in China. It's a two-track strategy, they say, according to which sales region the cars are going to be sold in and which battery they get, according to etnews.com. The form factor of the CATL battery hasn't been confirmed. Likely it'll be cell to pack lithium-ion phosphate technology and uh, we'll just get more news we'll just wait a month it'll be fine but what about how the car will look well korean car blog turned up in a multi-story car park by the look of it and saw one of these covered in the uh, the not just the camouflage but the the heavy duty wrap the zip up wrap that goes all around it often with padlocks on the zips and even if not you can't be touching what's not yours. There could be, you know, you could cause criminal damage. So if you're a YouTuber and you see one of these, you can't touch it, but you can get, you can look. No one can stop you. It's in a public car park. And uh, the pictures taken in South Korea by the channel Whooper TV, which, by the way, is a brilliant name for a YouTube channel, um, showed the car being bigger than the other, the previous Kona, the current Kona, which for many of my listeners, like I say, they're just getting the flat front, smooth front refresh one. Uh, this one is codenamed SX2E, with the E denoting Europe, not electric, apparently. Let me know what you think about that. And any of the stories we talk about on the podcast today, you can email me, hello, at evnewsdaily.com. Now, let's talk about this story. The Ukraine invasion by Russia is setting back the move to getting cheaper EVs on the road, according to a Reuters report. Should say, by the way, this is the least important thing to do with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But this is an EV podcast. If we are going to draw a line between that story and what we're talking about today, surging raw material costs made worse by the invasion could set back the dream of cheaper EVs, says this Reuters report. It's because of rising prices of nickel lithium and other materials, um, maybe even putting into reverse. This long-term trend we've seen of the cost of batteries, which have, I will say, broadly fallen from $1,000 per kilowatt hour installed at pack level to less than 100 now. Some say it's 
yet to hit 100. But if you look at those, particularly the Chinese cells coming from BYD, the blade battery, etc., that's uh, maybe $60, $65 uh, per kilowatt hour installed, which is a, you know, a massive price drop. But it could be a short-term increase in EV batteries because of this shortage, according to Gregory Miller, an industry analyst at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. The conflict in Ukraine has only raised these stakes, pushing nickel prices to an 11-year high on fears that exports from the leading producer, which is Russia, will be disrupted, almost certainly. Lithium prices have increased more than doubling since the end of last year, as supply fell short of demand, says Reuters. They say the average EV sold for $63,000 in January in the United States, 35% higher than the overall industry average for all vehicles, which, if you're interested, $46,000, according to Cox Automotive. Rivian last week tried to push through a 20% price hike on their vehicles and got such pushback from those who had already placed orders. After just 48 hours, they did a complete U-turn and reversed that attempted price rise. LG supplies the likes of Tesla and General Motors. They said that the raw materials account for up to 80% of the entire cost of the battery, and that is what is going up. Link to that story in the show notes so you can read more. Coming very soon, we'll ask you whether higher gas prices at the pump will lead to more EVs on the road and Aston Martin going electric with the help of a British company. Stick around, those stories are on the way. Now, let's talk about Model 3 deliveries being delayed in China. When I say delayed, just you've got to wait a little bit longer for those vehicles. Deliveries of the Model 3 and Model 3 Performance now expected to be up to 20 weeks, showing online as 16 to 20 weeks in China, up from 12 to 16 weeks. Prices remain unchanged. The updated timeline means that customers who place an order now uh, could get their vehicle as soon as the end of June, says Benzingar.com. The entry-level Model Y's wait period has actually gone down by two weeks, 10 to 14 weeks now, although the Model Y long range has been stretched by four weeks. Performance again unchanged. And for everybody who is a, an armchair commentator online will tell you, well, that's because everybody wants a Tesla, and so it's all to do with demand. It could equally be to do with uh, supply of various components. So we don't know. We don't know until we get those numbers, which should be this week, actually, the, the uh, historical numbers uh, in China to see how they've done so far. But we won't know until we get the full story. It could be either. It could be both of those things. Now, let's talk about how EV sales are rising and uh, the prices are rising amidst high gas prices at the pump. The electric car market is turning into the Bay Area's newest real estate market with people offering thousands of dollars over the asking price, says NBC Bay Area. Low inventory also has a lot to deal with it. The San Mateo Auto Sales uh, executive Tony Bahari says that he is seeing 10 times the normal interest in EVs. A lot of people I've been speaking to are thinking gas prices are going to be 7 or $8 a gallon, and they don't want to be in that situation, he said. For example, the Chevrolet Bolt, one of the more popular hybrid cars, says this article, they mean Volt, don't they? Bolt's not a hybrid. You can't buy one. They're on a stop sale at the minute because of the fires. So I think they mean Volt. I think. Uh, the San Mateo Auto Sales dealer said that the Volts doesn't last more than three days on the lot. With no stock at dealerships, they're adding 35% to the price. I'll pop a link to that story in the show notes if you would like to read more. And it'll be our new question of the week at the end of the podcast as well. Now, Aston Martin inking a deal with British Volt to develop what they say is high-performance battery cell technology. As Aston Martin gears up to launch a full electric car... But not for three years. 2025 is when they're aiming for that. The two firms have signed an agreement announced today. A joint R&D team to what they say is design, develop and industrialise battery packs, including bespoke modules and battery management systems. According to the business, all of its new product lines offer the option of an electrified powertrain by 2026 as CNBC.com. So... Again, not the most of ambitious of targets. That in four years' time will be electrified. That's the word they use when they don't want to say electric, you know. Uh, British Volt is building a gigafactory in uh, Northumberland. It's a county in the northeast of England. And they've got the backing from the government and Glencore as well. Now, VinFast is a company who will want to be making some noise this year. The Vietnamese EV maker is entering the European markets of Netherlands, Germany and France and lease plan 
are helping them do that with flexible financing options, they say. VinFast also aiming for a listing on the US Stock Exchange. Uh, January, a couple of months ago, they showed off five EVs at CES in Vegas. Not all of them are coming to Europe, though. We're going to get the VF8 and the VF9. They are all-electric SUVs, starting at 44 and 58,000 euros, respectively. Uh, but there is a monthly battery rental fee on the VinFasts, and hey, we've not seen them yet. They're not on the market, haven't driven them. So for now, it's a bit of jam tomorrow, but watch this space. Now, um, SAIC, the Chinese company who own MG Motor, have another smaller vehicle coming out towards the end of the year. This is going to be a competitor for the ID3, the Cupra Born, those kind of vehicles. We don't know what it's called yet. We think maybe it's the MG4, codenamed MG EH32. Possibly, Car News China saying it'll be called the MG Cyber E. Either way, uh, we've seen some pictures of this. It's not designed as a fossil car, uh, dis, you know, moved into being an EV. This is a bespoke EV. They've got some battery pack options at MG. They could use the smaller one from the new MG ZS or the larger one. So maybe, you know, 58 or 70, late 70 uh, kilowatt hour, which will give you plenty of range. We see a picture of the inside of it, obviously still covered in, you know, bits of fabric covering up the interior. Uh, but there's the central armrest with lots of storage space, a large touch screen and a fully digital cockpit in front of the driver behind the wheel and a panel extending from under the big screen in the middle uh, with the gear selector and a rotary dial. So yeah, the uh, MGs will have the rotary dial, but like the Kia e Nero as well. And so expect the base price of the MG4 to be well under 30,000 euros. And we could see that by the end of the year. Now Mercedes-Benz trucks begin sales uh, of the all-electric Actros with the steering wheel on the proper side. Right-hand drive versions now on sale, says Mercedes-Benz. A range of 249 miles, that's 400 kilometers, now available to order as a 4x2 or 6x2 chassis. Uh, customer deliveries begin in May. This is so important because working vehicles, I talk about this all the time, you know this, working vehicles do so many more miles than the cars you and I drive, which are parked in our driveway, you know, nine times out of ten. Working vehicles, so important to get them away from dirty diesel. Um, Mercedes-Benz trucks have adopted a direct sales model they've been using for the 7.5 ton Fuso e-canter. Each battery pack they install has 112 kilowatt hours, usable 97, and you can stack them. So, the three stack will do 300 kilometers, the four stack, you guessed it, about 400 kilometers, and uh, it'll take up to 17.7 .7 tons as a payload, so very, very useful. Charges at 160 kilowatts, though, which seems a little bit slow, because that's an hour to get from 20 to 80 percent. But again, I don't know what the use case of these vehicles are. It could be that they're going to be stopped for an hour at a depot or unloading or for the pallets to be taken off, or maybe certainly here in Europe, I know it's different in the US, we have quite strict rules on driver driving time. And so it could be that, well, the driver has to stop for a mandated hour and plug it in. It's going to be stopped anyway. So, you know, he or she's going to be taking a break and having some food. Anyway, let's move on. Opel, Vauxhall to me. Opel is becoming a purely electric brand, but not until... 2028. So you could look at this as being amazing. Opel Vauxhall, all electric 2028. Or you could say Opel Vauxhall selling fossil cars for the next six years. I mean, it's two ways of looking at every situation, aren't there? Um, but customers at the minute can get small Opel cars like the Rox E, big ones like the Movano E Transporter. And they're going to follow it up in the mid decade with the uh, famous name Manta coming back as well. And at the minute, you can get the commercial vehicles. We've got loads of EVs over here in Europe. I say over here, but in Europe, which my US listeners and viewers don't get. We've got the Combo E, the Vivaro E, the Movano E. So whether you want shuttle buses or MPVs or vans, panel vans, you've got small Vauxhall Corsa E, the Mocha E, uh, loads of cars from that group on the market right now. Tons of choice. And I'll pop a link to the Stellantis media site uh, for you to read more in the show notes. Now, the UK powertrain specialist, Sayeta, are stepping up efforts to retro-convert buses. And that's really important because what we don't want is to have to ditch a bunch of vehicles that are fine just because we want to get them off diesel. If that bus physically could do another million miles for the next 20 years, but 
we want to get diesel out of it. Well, let's keep the bus. Let's put a new powertrain inside. That's exactly what they do. Uh, powertrain conversions, including the gearbox, the propulsion system, the BMS, the inverters, etc., etc. Uh, the twin tire solution with front mounted. Um, rims has in-wheel motors that's really interesting isn't it and they have all the components that convert these to e-power takes out the gearbox that used the diesel vehicles used to have and so no energy is consumed by going through the gears therefore making it more efficient the battery packs go up to 422 kilowatt hours in these buses and i'll read i'll put a, a link in the show notes you can read more about the work they're doing which is really amazing and very finally i just saw a bunch of activity on twitter today about the neo et7 uh, the user jay in shanghai who often tweets tesla stuff saying neo et7 is the hottest ev on the market right now chinese social media blowing up with videos and pictures uh, the user 42 how say it's our turn to experience the neo et7 video coming in a couple of weeks they say mark andrews on twitter says i drove the et7 yesterday here are some pictures from the track looking at this vehicle yes it is a high-end luxury sedan from neo uh, it's got a bit of audi a6 about it from some angles at the front i think it's got a bit of porsche about it Styling looks good, and of course, as we know, it's very, very quick. 0 to 60, less than four seconds. 150 kilowatt hour battery pack in this. That is its uh, probably headline figure. And uh, just a ton of tech, a ton of autonomy in this. 33 smart sensors of various types to get to level four autonomy. Um, and of course, it's got the, what's it called? Nomi? Nomi? Nomi. Voice assistant. I'll pop a link to that in the show notes. You can read more. Question of the week with emobilitynorway.com. Um, here's a question. Do you think that rising fuel prices at the pumps will have a direct impact on EV sales or not? I don't know if it has a direct line. People will often carry on driving petrol and diesel and just whinge about the prices. Or do you think someone's going to be like, right, that's it. No, nope, I'm buying an EV this weekend. Is it that much of a direct correlation? I want to know your opinion on this. Email me, hello at evnewsdaily.com. Thank you so much for watching today. That's our show. Sign up to the audio version on Apple, Google, Spotify, and have a look at that Patreon page if you can help support the show anytime. It would be sharp, amazing. Have a good one, and I'll see you tomorrow.